Hey there, Grove men. How we doing? Uh, it's good to be with you today. We're so excited that you have chose to watch uh, online, whether you're watching by yourself or with a group. Um, we're excited to walk through the book of Galatians. And um, as we begin to look towards week one and hearing what Trevor has to share, we have a couple of announcements for you. Um, we have our men's conference coming up September 13th through the 15th. We've got a couple of spots left. We'd love to have you there. So if you get a chance, register online. That's in the men's uh, ministry section there at the grove.cc. Next, we've got the baptisms that are coming up on the 21st and the 22nd. That's something that you're considering. We'd love to talk to you about that. You can reach out to Trevor or any pastor at the church and they'd love to, to get you plugged in. Uh, with that being said, uh, we're excited to dive into week one and we're glad that you're here. I'm excited to hear what Trevor has to say. Let's give it a look. Okay, let's begin the exam. You'll have to let me know if you can see these words clearly. How does this look for you? Blurry and out of focus. Hmm. How about this one? Still out of focus. Well, perhaps this is what you need. Hey guys, Trevor here, and welcome to our Galatians Bible study. I'm thankful that you're tuning in and as we, as we open the book together. Today is day one. We're going to open the book and go to Galatians 1. So uh, excited to kick this off together with you. Uh, as I think about the beginning of this letter, one of the things that uh, comes to my mind, one of the images that comes to my mind is uh, the beach. And the reason is because my girls, my daughters, and my wife were just there the other day and they were telling me the story about what had happened. You see, my girls love to go to the beach and while they were out there playing in the water, swimming around, duck diving, and having a good time, there began to be an issue. You see, the lifeguard came running out and saying, hey, everybody out of the water, everybody out of the water. And one of the lifeguard boats came up and was hanging out in the, a little bit off the shore. And everybody began to wonder, what's going on? What's going on? And like you, I was wondering, was there a shark in the water? No, that wasn't the issue. The issue was this. There was a strong rip current. And people were being pulled out rather swiftly. And the, the lifeguard was calling people out of the water so that they would be safe. You see, that's what happens. Uh, when there's a issue of harm or someone's threatening a situation or a circumstances are threatened, there's someone like a lifeguard or in other cases, we have law enforcement or people who will come to provide an intervention. And that's what the lifeguard did. He intervened that situation to bring the people to safety. That was his job. And he did what he was trained to do. You see, that's what officers do. They intervene when there's a, someone breaking the law to provide safety and security. And when things are, when people are facing some sort of threatening situation, that's, that's nice. It's nice to have somebody come in and, and provide that layer of security. And here's the thing I want to consider. I want us to consider. So we look into Galatians. I want us to think about this. We have an intervening God. That's right. God is one who intervenes. See, we think about God as our creator, our maker, the one who makes heaven and earth or who has made heaven and earth. He's a sustainer. He's the one who makes it spin and float. But here's the other thing. God does intervene. You see, there's this popular idea that God is a dea or that, that uh, it's a beliefism about deism, a deism, that people are deists. If you're a deist, what you believe is that God is real. He is a creator and a maker. But after he created and made the heavens and earth, he just wiped his hands and stepped away and got on to bigger and better things. But what we believe as we hold the scriptures is that God is not only our creator and maker, but he is deeply involved. He is a sustainer and an intervener. That's right. He intervenes. As we look from Genesis to Revelation, God intervenes. He has a plan. He's involved. He's integrated. It's his story. He's made promises. In fact, he's even come, lived amongst us. So uh, we're going to look at this with that in mind, and Galatians is a way that God is intervening. Now before we open the book, I just want to look at one idea about how God intervenes. You see, that's the big idea here. I want us to see God intervenes. And one of the big verses, we could look at a lot of verses from, again, Genesis to Revelation, but John 3.16 is the one that comes to my mind. 
You see, in John 3, 16, we know that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. This is a verse many of us are familiar with. Uh, it's a verse we see people in the background in the end zones at football games waving in the air, John 3, 16. But what I love about John 3, 16 is that it's true. It's a story about how God has intervened, giving his own son for our salvation. You know, on that note, we could look uh, briefly at one little story. I'll just give you a synopsis of it. Uh, this is a story in Exodus where God has provided for his people there. You see, in the second book of the Bible, God's people, a people he made a promise to, are in slavery. You see, they're uh, being overran by the Egyptian people, and God has, they have called out to God and asked for God to deliver them. And God does. He sends a leader to go down and to the Egyptian people, uh, to the Israelite people who are enslaved by the Egyptians, and bring them up out of Egypt. Now here's the reason I tell you this. Because when we think about the way God intervenes, He does intervene for them. And He cares for them. He loves them. He takes them up out of Egypt, out of their circumstances. You see, a lot of times when we think about, about intervention, we think about God, save me from my circumstances. And in this particular story, that's exactly what happened. God had saved the people from their circumstances. He pulled them up out of slavery. They were now free in the desert. And guess what happened when they went out to the desert? They began to sin like no other. You see, it wasn't their circumstances that they needed to be saved from and delivered from. It was their sin. And that's the story of the Old Testament. God delivers them again and again and again. But it isn't until Jesus comes that we get deliverance from our sin. And so let's take a look about uh, in, in how God intervenes. We're going to look specifically at three ways in the introduction of Galatians to see how God intervenes. Again, mind you, we're only looking at the introduction of the book. And already here we see how God intervenes. First off, I want us to see that God intervenes by providing spiritual leadership. That's right, leadership. God is, has a way of providing leaders for us, bringing leaders amongst us to intervene our lives and lead us in the way that he wants us and calls us to go. In this case, Paul is one of those ones that God has provided as far as leadership is concerned. It says in Galatians 1, 1 that Paul is an apostle. Now, an apostle is a big term. In our New Testament, it's only used of a few people. In fact, it's used to describe the 12 disciples that followed Jesus. They were apostles. And so let's take a look at what this says. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. So here Paul is writing this church. He's writing as an apostle. He's claiming that apostolic leadership, that role, which was bestowed upon him by specifically Jesus Christ. He was made an apostle. He was, then this was something he didn't earn, but God has given him this role through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who called him into this role. In fact, that was one of the prerequisites to become one of the the major apostles in the first century, in the first generation of the church. Uh, the disciples, the 12 disciples, they all became apostles, minus Judas. And Paul becomes one of these apostles. Specifically, these apostles were used by God to begin to take the gospel to the, to the generations, to the area. They were the first generation of people who were starting churches. In fact, it was the apostles that wrote the scripture. Uh, Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, John, behind each of these Gospels is apostles. Paul is an apostle who writes 13 letters in the New Testament. Again, one of the prerequisites of the writing of our New Testament was this apostolic authority. Now, we don't call people apostles today. Uh, certainly, I'm not an apostle. Uh, if you want to make Daniel feel a little uncomfortable, Pastor Daniel, go ahead and refer to him as an apostle. Uh, you will see him literally cringe. Uh, you see, that's just not a term we use today. Because when we look at apostles, uh, we recognize this as first-generation disciples who were given the title specifically by Jesus. It's not a title that was handed down to the next generation. Rather, we're called pastors or elders or 
teachers. In fact, when Paul is recruiting leaders and leadership for the church, what he gives us in 1 Timothy 3 or Titus 1, gentlemen, my friends, these are great passages, by the way, to get familiar with in regard to spiritual leadership. If you want to grow as a leader, be familiar with 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. It talks about these, these passages are Paul literally writing and saying these are qualifications for leadership in the church uh, for God's people. But he does not use the word apostle in that context. It's, it has to do more with being an elder or teacher or pastor. Again, the idea why I say that is because Paul is really off the bat recognizing that this role as an apostle is given to him strictly by Jesus. It is a unique role that he has. But nonetheless, God does provide uh, leadership. In this particular area, I want you to see where Galatia is. Galatia is modern day Turkey. So if we're looking at Galatia, this is uh, the area. This is actually Paul's first journey, his first missionary journey. This is where he would have gotten acquainted with them. He's right here in this particular area. He would have sailed this way, came up, went. This is all Galatia. And then he comes back and he returns. And it's believed that he wrote his letter uh, from there in Antioch. Now, uh, this is, again, modern-day Turkey. Some of these churches that were in this area are, are uh, still the ruins of it. You can go and visit. So if you ever go to Turkey to visit some of our global partners, you have a great opportunity to see some of the beginnings of the church. Uh, many, in this case, it's not written to one particular church. There were several in the area that were started through Paul's ministry. And so that's important because this is a letter that would have been handed to different churches, not just one church, but it would have been circulated uh, in many of the churches he went to. Now, again, God provides spiritual leadership. Paul is a spiritual leader provided for his people, for God's people in that particular area as the church is growing. Um, you know, God does that today. God is providing leaders. Now, not just political leaders, but specifically spiritual leaders. That is the way God ministers to his church. He raises up leaders. And for us, it's important for us to pray for our leaders, that our leaders would remain faithful, tried, and true uh, to God as we follow and trust, as, as God leads the church and leads his people through the leaders that he provides for it. So not only does God intervene by providing leaders, what he also does is he intervenes by providing blessing. Now, I thought about calling this spiritual blessing, but I really want to emphasize relational blessing. And here's why. There's, as we look at this passage, there's a couple of terms I want us to see, specifically all in regard to relationship. First off, grace. This has to do with giving somebody something. It is a gift. You don't earn grace. You don't find grace. It is given to you from one person to another. And in this case, God has given to us grace. This grace comes through the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's going to be linked, but it comes from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, grace, a gift. In contrast to works, it is something, again, that is provided and given to us. The other thing I want us to point out, or I want us to see, is peace. You see, peace has to do with uh, the absence of war. You see, we live in a world today where there's all kinds of war and, and rivalries, but to pe for peace, for us to have peace, it's the absence of war. Specifically, namely, in regards to relationship, we are at war with God. We're at war with people around us. Enemies, even today, there's wars going al uh, along between different countries. We could be at war with neighbors. I mean, we, we, this is recognizing the tension we have relationally between people. But thirdly, we're at war even within ourselves. You see, we can have a battle within. Many of us have a war going on in, in our minds or in our soul, uh, which is, uh, gives recognition to the epidemic of mental illness and some of the challenges we have at it being at peace within ourselves. Some of us struggle with even being alone because we, we can't be in our own thoughts. And so there's a, sh a struggle and a challenge even at being in peace within ourselves. But here's the beauty of what God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ has provided. Not only grace, but peace. Peace with Him, peace with other people. God calls us to be at harmony uh, with everybody as so as it depends on us. Make every effort to be at peace with those around us, it tells us in Romans. And in this case also, God has given us peace to be at peace within ourselves, to be okay with who we are, to not want to constantly be something that we're not. And God allows us to rest 
in the fact that we are created and made in His image. We are uniquely designed and fearfully and wonderfully made. God has gifted each one of us uniquely, and we can be at peace with that. Being, being at peace with our, our, uh, our heart, our mind, our who we are, with the people around us, and most importantly, with God. Now, let's keep going. Pete, grace, peace, but also I want us to see that God delivers. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Uh, we'll come back to this. I want us to see that God has given uh, himself. God has given himself. He is so invested in this peace and this relationship and the blessing us in this way that he's given himself. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sin. You and I can never atone or cover or, or deal with our sin in and of ourself. We would, there's nothing, there's never enough that we could do. We're constantly in debt because of our sin. But Christ, Jesus, gave himself because of his perfection, because of who he is, he was able to give himself and cover us uh, in our sin. And that's, a, again, it's about a relational blessing. Jesus himself gave himself to save us from himself, his judgment that we deserved. God has given himself to us for that purpose. Now, let's keep going back to deliver. This idea of deliver has to do with rescue. You see, we are in a place where we are in danger. We are in harm. We are going to be swept away into judgment to, be, to, to pay for the penalty that our sins deserve. But God has delivered, the, delivered us not only from sin, but from this present evil age. Not only from the circumstances now, but for the eternal circumstances. We have security in Christ that we will forever be with Him. In this world, we will have trouble, it says in Scripture. We will have challenges. Circumstances will come. They will be difficult. Why? Because it is a present evil age. This is a hard age. This is a sinful age. The evil one is attacking, and he has his influence here. From pop culture to Hollywood culture to our own homes and our own hearts, evil finds its way, and it finds its influence. It's just the age we live in. But... God has come to deliver us from that, to secure for us the eternal age. He's gonna, he has come to deliver us so that we will be with him and alongside him forever. You know, Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer, uh, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You see, Jesus has come to deliver us. An ultimate deliverance is when he takes us to be with him forever in eternity, where there will be no pain, there will be no death, there will be no war, there will be no evil, there will be no sin. We will be with him forever, relational blessing alongside those who belong to him. That's a wonderful blessing that we have in Christ. Lastly, the thing I want us to see is the will of God our Father. Uh, all this is God's plan. It's God's working God's design, God has, is not making this up. He's already determined what he's doing and he's inviting us to be a part of it. In fact, he wants to, the offer is extended for us to find this blessing in Christ, this relational blessing that's available to us. Again, God provides by intervening, giving us leaders, and he provides by giving us all these blessings which are found in Christ. Again, this is just the introduction to the book. Now, let's take a look at our next slide here. Um, in summary, God provides grace, peace, sacrifice, deliverance, and this is all according to his plan. These are the ways God blesses us for the sake of relationship. Again, this is not a prosperity gospel. That's one of the false gospels that we have in our, uh, in our era is that God blesses us by giving us things, giving us things to hold on to or to have. But God's blessing is much more than material. It is in the form of restoring relationship, which everything we talked about in this first couple of verses has to do with restoring that relational blessing. Now, the way that Paul ends this greeting is that he turns to praise. He recognizes God is worthy of praise. He's worthy of glory forever and ever. And the way this is termed is that God is worthy of glory into the ages. And it's a nice way of saying forever and ever. You see, God is worthy of our worship. God is worthy of our praise. God is worthy of our obedience. God is worthy of glory. 
And that's a nice way to wrap up the introduction as he helps us see God has intervened. He's intervened by providing leadership. He's intervened by providing blessing. And because of that, he is worthy of praise. So that's our introduction to the book. Uh, we have a couple of discussion questions for you guys. I want to um, highlight, yeah, in summary, our last point, because he is, as we read in verse 5, uh, we, we need to give God praise for his interventions. So praise God. Will we praise God together for his interventions? I hope uh, it'd be a great time to even take some prayer, uh, have some prayer time as a group, and just recognize the influence or the intervening of, of leadership that God has brought into your life. Uh, some of the blessings God has brought into your life. And we'll do that by means of discussion questions here. Uh, and, and give God praise for the way that he has intervened in your life. Why? Because he's deserving of it. So again, thanks for joining us. May God bless you.